Ladies and gentlemen of the web, welcome to Gary Wise vs. the World, the show in which poker players from around the industry come and trash and share some uh, opinions over the issues of the day. I am your host, Gary Wise. Here's how this is going to work. Each week, I'm going to be joined by four guests with extensive experience in the poker business. We're going to talk about industry goings on for that particular week. I mean, I can't promise we'll poker this week uh, every time, but uh, you know, this is the first episode, so we got some, some big names out. Uh, still, poker players talk, they talk, and it should be good times. Join us today uh, in order around my screen. We have in the upper left-hand corner Mr. Aaron Bean, professional player and, uh, and opinion maker on, on uh, 2 plus 2com Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, our pleasure. I, I'm looking forward to you uh, saying inflammatory things. Uh, next, we have uh, Full Tilt Poker Poker Boy and where a fine hats Andy Block. Andy, uh, you're not in Europe yet. Nope, I'm heading there in two days. Great. Uh, well, we're happy to have you in the meantime. Phil Galfond, uh, who is the name for God on the hearts and lips of all online poker players. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Gary. Welcome to uh, Poker Static. Hey, it's exciting to be here. You know, uh, it's, it's a, a, a opportunity I have to flap my, uh, flap my lips. You know that I'm going to take advantage. Uh, one person who knows that very well, uh, joining us, the senior writer from Bluff Magazine and uh, stalwart in WPT coverage, Jessica Wellman. Jessica, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. So, folks, uh, it's very simple. I want you to talk to one another. I want you to share your opinions, and we're going to have a good show. Uh, amongst the items for discussion today, the Poker Hall of Fame, uh, whether Sorrell Mitchell really came clean, whether Pellad Friedman shot the angle on national television, and if time allows us, and we're going to try to keep this to an hour, we're going to talk a little WCOOP. So let's get down to business. Segment one, the Poker Hall of Fame. Last week, Harris announced the final list of nominees for the World Series of Poker Hall of Fame. Uh, the list, Jesus Ferguson, Barry Greenstein, Jen Harmon, Dan Harrington, Phil Ivey, Linda Johnson, Tom McAvoy, Daniel Legranu, Scotty Wynn, and Eric Seidel. So, we, before we get to the picks and the preferences, are you guys satisfied with the list? We're, we're going to start with Phil Galfon because this is his, uh, his website. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel actually maybe the least qualified of this group to comment on this, but uh, it seems like a good list. And um, Yeah, I guess I'll stick with that for that question. Okay, Andy Block, you're friends with uh, happy I, guys. I think I would add Huck Seed to the list. He's a guy I think is not very good at self-promoting himself. And that's why he doesn't get added to this list. But, I mean, if you just look at his accomplishments, World Series of Poker main event winner back in 1996, I believe. And, you know, he just won the Tournament of Champions. He's won the NBC Heads Up. I mean, this guy, and he's hot right now. He's done really well the last couple of years. I know there's a couple of years where he wasn't very active and winning a lot on the poker scene. But his name, I think, deserves to be on there, if not this year, at least in the future. Well, it's interesting. Doesn't Huck's name kind of get lost in the mix with world champions with four or five bracelets? You know, we've already got Scotty Wynn and Jesus Ferguson on this list. Top up in that same category. And like you said, those two are better branded. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that. I mean, Huck is kind of a quiet guy lately, so the media and the ESPN has not really focused on it. Aaron Bean, before this show, you told me you had some inflammatory opinions about the Hall of Fame. How about it? Well, I really didn't know much about the Hall of Fame at all before before you told me this was one of the topics on here. So I, I looked up the, the criteria for the Hall of Fame, and uh, they're they're pretty uh, pretty standard. You know, uh, I've got it here. It's uh, played poker against top competition, played for high stakes, played consistently well, stood the test of time. And then for non-players, there's a different set, which I think the different set applies perfectly to Linda Johnson. I have, I have no issue with her at all. I think uh, I'm a little bit concerned about Scotty Wynn because I don't believe he's earned the respect of his peers. And, uh, you know, I don't think that he's someone that we would want in the Hall of Fame. And I'm also a little skeptical of the idea of a poker Hall of Fame in general, especially since it's, it's the World Series Hall of Fame. And I think poker is a lot more than the World Series of Poker. Jessica Wellman, what do you think? Scotty Wynn deserves to be on this list. Um, I... I think that he's the person – I don't mind him being included on the list. I don't think he's going to get in this year. I think a similar example to show you how people have kind of self 
regulated is that Men Win was on this list last year, didn't make this list this year. I don't think that he's going to get in or Scotty's going to get in and he might go the way of men where he makes the list a couple years and then kind of falls off the the spectrum for a little bit. But I am hearing some of the people I've talked to who have votes are voting for him. So I don't know if they feel the same way that Aaron does about it as a, from a player's perspective as much as from a fan's right. perspective. Are you suggesting that, that Men Wen has done something unsavory to get himself off his list? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, good answer, good answer. Um, so, as expected, on, uh, if you go to uh, the 2 plus 2 uh, forums or any of a number of other online outlets, uh, when the discussion comes up, the, the names that are being thrown out are Phil Ivey, Dan Harrington, Barry Greenstein. Harrington, of course, kind of shaped the way tournament poker is being played now. Greenstein is... is Seen by many as a bridge between the online and, and live world, and Ivy is God. Are, are, you, are you guys surprised by this? And, and how much of an indication of the broader thought process is that viewpoint? Uh, we'll start this one with Phil Galphon. I mean, the thing about Ivy is that he's going to be in the Hall of Fame eventually. I just feel like he's probably done half of what he's going to do, or less than that, uh, at the WSOP. So I feel like he has plenty of time to get in. We don't need to. To, to let him in now. I think that's not surprising to see the three of them. Uh, like the, the two that, that came to mind uh, for me um, were Ivy and Harrington. Um, and even though Harrington doesn't have the bracelets that some of these guys have, um, obviously like the back-to-back -back main event final tables is something that will probably never be done again. Um, and then like with everybody talking about Scotty, I feel like, I mean, I agree. And I feel like guys like, like Barry and like Eric would both be, you know, much better ambassadors or role models in poker. Um, I think all those guys are good options. Andy Block, trade pieces with half these guys. Who are you liking right now? Um, you know, I think they're all good choices. I think uh, almost all of them will probably get into the Hall of Fame eventually. Uh, and I'm not really sure. I mean, are they going to pick one of them? Is just going to be one this year like it ended up being last year? Um, you know, I think there's, of course, a good argument that Ivy's probably – the most famous out of all that group, and if he just went from that character, he'd be in there. But, you know, some people might say, well, Ivy's just a little bit too young right now to be voted in. But, so know, Ivy's I think, was voted in, though. Right. I don't know if so you guys I are think, aware of that. I think Phil Ivy is, is a better player with better, even better results in well, some ways, and well, I think we certainly much more that. respect from his peers. Definitely. Definitely. So, I mean, I would probably vote for Phil Ivey. <laughs> so you would. Now, for those of you who wouldn't, who would not vote for Phil Ivey right now? All right, Jessica, how old does Phil Ivey have to be to get your vote? I don't think it's a matter of age, but I think it's, it's like what Phil said. He hasn't accomplished nearly what he's going to accomplish in his career. What are we going to do when he wins 16 bracelets and duck him again? Uh, I feel like you're, you need to wait because he hasn't really – done his career yet it's just getting off the ground and i want to see him you know hit his peak but, and then maybe fall not be on the scene as much before we induct him not induct but should we be holding him to the hall of fame standard or the phil ivy standard i i'm not i i think bj nemeth was the one who suggested like imposing like an age requirement of 40 years i don't mind an age requirement but i also think I don't know many Hall of Fames where you induct people in the height of their careers. It's just not something that in sports you see. It's it's once they've hit their peak and gone out to pasture that you kind of put these people in. And I think the Poker Hall of Fame is a weird exception because people play late in their lives. I think there could be an age limit, uh, you know, 35, 40, before you get put on the ballot the first time. But, yeah. you know, I don't know if there necessarily needs to be one. I mean, just because, you know, most sports – leagues you can't be on the Hall of Fame until after your career is over doesn't mean that poker has to follow that, that same that All right, Andy. model. Let's take another one. One of the great things about poker is people can talk, can play with their heroes and you can play with them when they're at the, the prime of their career and compete with them. And I think, you know, Phil Ivey being part of the Poker Hall of Fame uh, would, you know, would be, I think, a good thing for the Hall of Fame, too. So now, folks, the question is, does the Hall of Fame need to establish more specific criteria for voting? 
Aaron Bean. Well, one idea that I had was that poker could have more of a, you know, athletes, pro athletes retire, and there's there's often ceremony associated with that, and they can be inducted after they retire. And so rather than having an age requirement, which wouldn't really necessarily accomplish much because people come into the game sometimes in their 50s or 60s or sometimes in their 40s, you know, who are players of different ages have different levels of experience, you could have people, you know, not everyone, of course, but, but players like Phil Ivey or, or, or older players that have been around longer when they're ready retire in some way and have, have them be recognized at the World Series. And, of course, they'd still continue playing after they retired. But after they retire officially, they might be eligible for the Hall of Fame. Aaron B., are you, are you suggesting a mandatory number of hands retirement uh, stage in a career? I think Phil Gallopin will have to quit. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, okay, so going even younger. This brings up a good point, because Tom Dwan, for example, is a name that many people have suggested should be in the Hall of Fame, right or wrong, at the age of 22. The man has played a million games. How do you balance time in the number of hands? Jessica? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for that one, just because standing the test of time, I, it seems like that lends itself to age better than it does hands logs because you can log a fair number of hands online in a short period of time that that standard just suggests you're going to have to be a little older in order to be in the Hall of Fame. Phil Galvan yeah, is doing some neat camera tricks <laughs> right here. <laughs> I need to grab Make a shark. Sure. Sorry, guys. Hey. Uh, I, I want one more to answer. Who do you vote for right now, Tom Dwan or Tom McAvoy? Aaron Bean. Neither one. Andy Black. I think, I think Tom Dwan has not stood the test of time. I think test of time does not mean enough hands that we know he's a winning player. I think it means being around and, and having the respect of his peers for many years, which has nothing to do with coming in. <laughs> Tom McAvoy, I just don't think, has poker accomplishments to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's right. World Championship, multiple bracelets, 900 books written. I see what you're saying, though. Andy Block, one word answer. Aaron Bean didn't quite get that so much. Tom. Andy Block. Tom. Tom. Phil Galpo, one word answer. <laughs> I, since nobody's answered, McAvoy. Okay. Jessica Wellman. Abstain. Oh, uh, you could have gone with Tom. All right. <laughs> if you, Jessica, do you have a ballot? Are you voting this year? No, Lance gets the vote from Bluff. But he's going to talk to the other Bluff employees, so I have somewhat of a say. Okay, well then let's start with you. If you have a ballot and you are allowed to cast two votes, which two candidates are you voting for? Eric Seidel and Linda Johnson. Why Linda Johnson? I think that her accomplishments and contributions to developing women in poker, to developing poker media, and developing poker as a whole are pretty much unmatched by other people on this list. I Maybe Barry has a similar... Uh, resume, but I don't think so. Realistically, shouldn't she have been the first woman in the Poker Hall of Fame? I was surprised to hear that Barbara Enright was in the Hall of Fame, so I would say yes. Aaron Bean, who are you voting for? Tough to pick two. Harrington and Seidel. All right, I think uh, Linda will make it, though, eventually. I like I like the synergy of, of the two Mayfair players going together. It's, uh, that, that has a good feel to it. I don't know if if people know what the Mayfair is, but that's the club where both guys came up. Andy Block, who are you voting for? Uh, Harrington and Ivy. Uh, why Ivy? Is it time? Because it's, it's time? Because it's Ivy. It, I mean, it's obviously, if he had won the main event last year, it'd be an easy pick. And, you know, if he had uh, or even finished second. So right now you could say he's got more time. Maybe he'll win the main event. Let's wait until then. But, you know, I think his accomplishments so far, uh, even if he quit playing right now, would he get voted in in a couple of years? I think the answer is definitely yes. Phil Galpon, who you vote for? Tom Dwan and who? I, I'll <laughs> vote for uh, Greenstein and Seidel. Um, somebody, we also didn't mention Negreanu, but also I feel like he's a little too early in his career. Um, you, know what, you, you know where Daniel suffers? Daniel suffers in the fact that he has the exact same problem as Ivy and he doesn't have Ivy's eight bracelets. Yeah. 
That's very true. It's really what it is. You know, all respect in the world to Daniel. He's just not ready to get in until Phil Ivey gets in first. So, all right, folks, that was the Hall of Fame thing. We're, we're going to move on to something a little bit more scandalous, all right? A little over a week ago, Bluff Magazine's Player of the Year leader, Sorrel Mitty, made an encyclopedic post on 2 Plus 2, discussing his feelings about his unscrupulous past behavior, ways he's defied the assorted TOCs, and his belief that he's paid enough for his crimes against the poker community. In doing so, he's admitted to new TOC violations and created a bit of an uproar. Uh, thoughts on his post, starting with Aaron Bean. Okay, before I even get started here, I want to make it clear that, well, I think Sorrell has done some things wrong. I don't think he's the biggest villain in poker, and I think that there's a lot of real serious cheating that, that goes on for a lot more money and, and in a lot more malicious way than, than anything Sorrell's ever done. But I also think that he clearly broke the rules out of greed for profit for himself, and he attempted to, you know, if they hadn't taken his money, he would have made 200 k from it. And I think at the time that he that he got caught cheating, it was pretty much considered unacceptable behavior, and I think everyone has reacted to his, his crime in an appropriate way. Uh, Andy Block, I don't know if yeah. you ever go online these days, but do you agree? <laughs> I go online a lot. Um, I probably play more online than live. But, yeah, I think, you know, he's one of his uh, justifications is he didn't think back 2007, it was clear that what he did was against the rules. But, you know, I think it was 100% clear. I mean, the rule said, the full tilt rule said, players are not allowed to create, use, or deposit to more than one account. He used another account, period. It's against the rules. And, you know, it, it clearly was unfair to the other players in the tournament who thought, you know, they're playing, they're not playing against Phil Goff. They're, they're not playing against uh, great players who get to play multiple times. You know, they're playing... You know, they. You know, if a bad player gets chips, they're going to have a chance to play against them, and not have have a great player buy against them. So, you know, it was unfair. It was unethical. And here's here's one of the ways that you can ask yourself: Was this unfair? I mean, online, of course, is different than live. But ask yourself: If he did the same thing in a live tournament, if he like bought somebody's uh, bought somebody's uh, chips in the middle of a tournament, would that be unethical? I mean, if he during a break, for example. Uh, or when his table gets broken, if he switched places with somebody else, would that be unethical? I think we'd all say definitely, and he should be barred from poker for life. So, you know, the thing is, the idea is, oh, that this is online, everybody was doing it. Well, that doesn't fly because, first of all, everybody wasn't doing it. Yes, there were some people that were doing it a lot, but everybody wasn't doing it, and it's something that, if you think about it, is clearly wrong. All right, double diving for a moment. Online and live poker are two completely different games. Online poker, you're dealing with a set of rules where you can only punish a cheater if they admit they cheated. What's the point of having that kind of a rules, a rules card? Just go well, That's not true. That's it's not, not true, true at all. That you, don't, you can't. You, Sorrell got caught in almost all of these instances. IP address checks, um, investigations by full tilt it's my understanding from some of the players that pretty much every screen name that he admitted to using on full tilt people had figured out he used on full tilt and those accounts got banned is it problematic to have rules that can't be enforced every time they're violated sure but that doesn't mean that speeding still isn't against the law uh, it's it's the same kind of thing you're running the risk of getting caught if you do it and yeah you may get away with it but that doesn't make it okay Phil Galfond, was Sorrell too honest or not honest enough? I mean, you can never be too honest. I mean, maybe for his own good he was too honest, but I think in terms of getting his reputation back a little bit, um, like you always want to want to be honest. The thing is, though, you know, if somebody's admitting to so much, you never know how much more there is that they're not admitting to. I don't know him personally at all. I have no idea. Um, and I also am not like a big online MTT community member. However, I will say that, if he's saying, I don't know whether a lot of people were doing it back then or not, if everybody was doing it or not, but I know. Absolutely that, like, not. No? Okay. I, I just know that many, there are some, like, rules, and, like, many years ago, it was, like, commonplace and accepted. But that was you know, not 2007. That was 2005, 2004. Yeah, 2005. Well, but there's where, a lot of like, talk in those threads about PTA and about, you know, there are some, some names being thrown around. Actually, yeah. Where, mm -hmm. 
kind of, what do you say to that? What action you just did resulted in a discussion that resulted in the conclusion that doing that was unacceptable. I mean, he, that that's an argument that for what Sorrell doing being blatantly wrong because Jeff did that in part to prompt the discussion that it created, and the discussion was was a unanimous conclusion and a revision of various sites, terms, and conditions, and it was the outlawing of buying accounts. Andy Block, what is the more serious violation, Sorrell's actions in 2007 or his opening accounts during his suspension on Full Tilt Poker? Well, they're, they're both pretty serious, but what he should have done is once he got caught, once that whole incident happened, he should have said, okay, told, told the site, hey, I'm going to stay clean for a few months. I'm not going to play. I'm going to show you that I've changed, that you can trust me. And instead, what he did is he went and said, I don't care. You can't stop me from playing. I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep trying to play under different accounts. And so now he showed that uh, he can't be trusted. So he has a lot of work to do to make up for the fact that over these last three years, he, he's shown that he, he's not able to follow the rules even after he's gotten caught. So he has to go and make up for that. How does he do that, Phil Galvan? It's really tough at this point. Honest, I feel like, you know, the first offense, um, again, without knowing, like, how commonplace and things like that and how accepted it was publicly, I feel like the, the, the punishment seemed kind of harsh. But the thing is, he could have earned back his reputation and respect uh, had he not gone and opened new accounts. The thing is now, like, if he felt really screwed over, I understand his reaction. But he needs when he makes that when he makes that choice to open new accounts, he has to know that he's never really going to be welcome back in the online poker. I think that, like, I, I think that he can't really be trusted at this point. Um, I think that yeah, he took it too far. Andy Block, will you take his calls if you want the helpful tilt poker security? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I guess uh, I'd give him a car ride if he uh, if he needs a ride somewhere, but uh, that, I don't know if I'd go that far. All right. Just go on. Is this a system of kids with tooth power not respecting the limitations of the structural rules and punishment in place? <laughs> Why do I get the broad cultural question? Um... Because you are a journalist of the highest esteem, and you are a person who I have faith can answer this question well. I think that if you really want a super academic answer, uh, a woman by the name of Mia Consalvo wrote a book called Cheating, talking about in video game culture and the way people play video games and grew up in video games, cheating was such an accepted part of playing, cheat codes, those kinds of things that you're seeing it translate into online poker where it has real life implications and it's not Mario. Uh, I think the fact that Sorrell is using justifications like, oh, but I couldn't play otherwise, when really he could play, his PokerStars account wasn't banned, was just his full tilt account that was banned, is a sign that people feel like if they can get away with cheating, they've done it before, and they're going to keep doing it. Aaron Bean, your thoughts? Well, you know, I think it's it's easy to stereotype, like, kids and this and that, and and, and you know, how we grew up playing video games and stuff like that. But there are plenty of people who who have behaved completely differently than Sorrell who have been in similar situations. Justin Bono, for example, I know, loves video games and grew up playing video games. And he, he, was, he was using multiple accounts, and he was using multiple accounts at a time when a lot of people actually were, I believe. And... He was playing a little bit before I got started, but but it was still going on as I was coming up, and and you know he reacted to his ban I thought in a very mature way, and he did step completely stepped away from online poker for several years, and didn't even play on on sites that hadn't banned him, and and you know when he was ready to come back he was you know he asked all the sites and he never he never did anything underhanded like making other accounts. And I think that there are a lot of people like like Justin who maybe made a mistake in the past, but can can handle things in a more responsible way. Andy Block, is this whole thing indicative of the fact that Full Tilt Poker, Poker Stars, and other major sites and entities within the industry need to come together to collaborate on punishments for individual players? Well, definitely. I mean, this is a good argument for. Um, uh, licensing and regulation of online sites. Like you said, they could collaborate 
Uh, if a player is banned on one site, they could be banned on multiple sites uh, as long as you know what they've done is proven to, to uh, a certain degree. Um, the other thing is we can make it harder for somebody once they've been banned to open up a new account on that site. And, you know, if you have the government licensing and regulate it, then there'll be ways to make it so that, like, in order to open up an account, maybe you actually have to go in to, you know, like a Western Union or a bank or something like that to verify. You know, you can't just – now it's too easy to create. A but here's the question then. Should an infraction only be punishable on one site? Should a player be punished on all sites? Yeah, I think that – it should be across all sites. I mean, it's the same games on all sites. And, um, you know, if somebody has shown that they're unethical on one site, they're absolutely going to, you know, likely do the same thing on other sites. Um, it's a tough thing to enforce. It's tough for the sites to get together. But in, in a perfect world, I think that would be uh, what we should do. All right. Well, if any of you folks know anybody at any of the major sites, have to give me a call, set something up. Last order of business on this particular issue. Going around the circle, how would you punish Sorrell now? Aaron Bean. Right now, I mean, I think Full Tilt has done the right thing. I think he should be banned. I think, you know, several years from now, if he if he has stopped creating accounts, maybe, you know, maybe they can look at it and unban him. Maybe they can decide never to unban him. That's, that's their prerogative. I don't think that he should be banned on other poker sites or, or banned from live tournaments. I think, you know, you do have to make a distinction between – he didn't collude with anyone, you know, he didn't hack anyone's account and, and, you know, there, there are much worse things that you can do in poker. And I think they should have more severe punishments than what he did. Andy Block. Well, first of all, despite this logo here, I don't speak for uh, full tilt. Um, so I can't really say what full tilt should do, but, you know, I think it's up to Sorrell first to take the first step admit, number one, that what he did was wrong, and he should have known that it was wrong. And that's really important because who knows, you know, what he might do next and say, oh, but, you know, I didn't know it was wrong. It wasn't spelled out clearly in the terms and conditions that other people were doing it. Well, that doesn't that doesn't excuse it. But the, you, you know, you should, you know what's in the terms and the conditions, and you know what's wrong in real life, and that's probably wrong on in, online, too. Andy, for what's worth, I hadn't even noticed the logo until you just pointed it out. <laughs> Phil Galfon, what do you do? I think that he should he should be banned for at least a while um, from online sites. I do think, and I don't know the answer to this, but I'm not positive that he felt he was doing something wrong while he was doing it. I think he sees now, hopefully now that it was. Um, but I think that's important, not in determining his punishment, but in determining, you know, what you think about his character. And I think if somebody is, thinks, I'm, I'm stealing money from these people, I'm going to do this, then uh, that's a much worse person than somebody that is misguided and thinks he wasn't doing something wrong. Well said. Jessica Wellman. I think the, the ban on full tilt is sufficient punishment. If 10 years down the line he's proven himself on banning him, doesn't seem – that far-fetched what i would like to have seen is in the future if this happens where he's used other accounts i would like to see more public punishment for the people who let him use their accounts because those are the people that seem to have gone completely unpunished in this whole thing interesting call all right folks we are going to move on because we have to eventually talk about something else that's something else Prahlad freeman did he shoot an angle uh i think the obvious answer is no but we're going to talk about it all right Last World Series of Poker episode on ESPN, a hand was shown between Pallad and a barking maniac in which the call called. Freeman made a call for all the between the counts. One on hand, apparently not understanding poker jargon or the structure of time, declared that Freeman's hand was dead, and Pallad immediately mocked when he saw that hand. Jessica Wellman, how do you find angle shot? What's an angle shot? Not this. Um, I don't, I, see, I'm not the player, so asking me what an angle shot is is probably not the best person to go to, but to me this doesn't seem well, like it fall into that instance. Uh, <laughs> Andy Block, please tell us what is an angle shot? Well, an angle shot is doing something that might not be technically or literally against the rules, but it gets your, take, it takes advantage of your opponent. It often takes advantage of a bad rule. For example, you know, some places there's a rule if you expose your hand and there's still action to go, your hand is dead. 
Now that's a really bad rule because then people take advantage of that rule and try to get people to expose your hand early. So there was a rule to try to avoid an angle shot, you know, exposing your hand, picking up a towel against the other player. And, and so they make a rule to stop that expose a bigger angle shot, taking advantage of the rules in kind of an unfair way. And in this case, it's not an angle shot. He didn't do anything wrong. Uh, it was a bad rule, and it really didn't seem like he tried to take advantage of it too much. He kind of just slowly mucked his hand and sat there kind of quietly, keeping out of the argument. I think he knew what the uh, what the answer would be, um, but, uh, you know, he didn't go and uh, jump up and down and try and state his case. I think, you know... It, it really is an unfortunate situation. I guess it kind of makes for interesting TV, though. Now, let me ask you, folks, can we all agree that an angle shot can be defined as trying to exploit the rules instead of playing within the spirit of the rules? Sure. Yes. yes. Okay. So we're in agreement, then, that he did not intentionally go out of his way to try to exploit the rules. However, in order to chat called this one of the biggest controversies in main event history, do we agree that that's, a, that's slightly hyperbolous? Uh, Phil, Slightly? Slightly. I mean, I don't uh, – I actually don't know a lot about uh, past tournament controversies, but I doubt that this, this would rank up there. I feel like – I mean, he tried to call. I believe he tried to call. And uh, the thing is, if he, if he had been shown a bluff, I don't know if he would have been allowed to win the pot. He probably would not have been allowed to win the pot because, uh, you know, the floor was there. They said the hand was dead. So uh, when they say the hand's dead, whether he had the best pin or not doesn't matter. He His hand was dead. And um, so, I mean, if he were to insist on giving the pot to the other player um, because he meant to call, uh, one, I don't know if they would even let him do that. But two, I think, I mean, it would be nice, but that would be charity because, it, it, you know, he was well within the rules. Bowman, you know your history. Do you think this was historic? I don't think so. I think it's far too early in the main event for it to really have had that huge of a bearing on the outcome of the tournament. I think the only reason we even heard about it is because Prahlad is a name player and someone we've heard of before. If this had been two unknowns, I'm sure similar rulings have happened every year in multiple events at the World Series. I don't even think you have to go that far back. If you go back to 2008, you have questionable rulings like Phil Helmuth being assessed a penalty at the end of like day five of the main event and coming back on day six and having it retracted. You have the pump fake situation the same year where players were pushing their chips over the line and then pushing them back and having it ruled not to be a call. And I think those are far more controversial decisions and that's not even that long ago. Aaron Bean, whose responsibility for fair play lie with, the player or the floor? Well, I think it absolutely lies with the floor, and I think there's there's kind of a, a larger a larger injustice here that we haven't really even talked about, which is not only is ESPN blowing this out of proportion and and really manufacturing this angle shot that didn't happen, but they aren't talking about the real problem, which is the the incompetent floor staff they have at the series. And you know, here we have one example caught on film, but I'm sure all I'm sure Phil and Andy saw plenty more of these these floor men that just make rulings that are just blatantly wrong or, or or just ignorant of the rules. And, you know, a lot of times the World Series has a lot of amateurs who don't necessarily know what they're doing, and it's very important to have the rules be even better policed at the World Series. And instead what you get is very poor enforcement. You get you get misinformed dealers and floor men and more floor men coming in and giving more opinions that are, you know, they, in that hand, for example, they got another another person to come in and give a ruling, and they still didn't get it right. You know, it seemed pretty obvious to me that Pra asked how many how much time he had, and they they said ten seconds, and then they gave him nine seconds. You know, well and now hold up a second. That's the controversy do really, here. Eric, do you really think that any amount of training can help a guy hear any better? You know, with regards to the time, it seems like it seems like this is a question of the floor man actually not hearing the guy call and therefore ruling it dead. It's not like the guy thought that the clock ran out at .5 seconds. And on top of that, you can't really blame the other floor guy. Charlie Cerisi, good floor man. They didn't ask him. They didn't ask, him. They didn't ask Prahlad. When, when, for example, when Matt Savage, who is an excellent tournament director, I've seen him come over to the table in similar situations, and I've seen the floor men that he has, at, at, for example, at Commerce or or whatever, and when, when competent staff come over, 
they they ask one at a time. They ask players, "Did you hear him say call?" And if a few of them say yes, they say when. And if they all agree on when, you know, they establish when he called. They don't just dismiss dismiss his hand is dead and and just make a snap judgment like that. It took a lot longer than what is shown on TV. I was standing there for a chunk of it. This was something that went on for somewhere in the vicinity of five or ten minutes, and you're seeing an edited down version of it. This was a a big deal. Several floor staff were appealed to. Lots of people were brought into the discussion that I think they did do diligence in terms of trying to assess the situation. I'm not saying they got it right. I, I would argue that they made an effort, though. i got to say, I'm excited to see you. Oh, go ahead, Phil. It seems like from watching it, the dealer heard him say call and repeated it um, before the right. was up. And I didn't see them ask Absolutely. the dealer. I don't know if the dealer can overrule, can't really overrule the floorman, but she can speak up or he can ask her. I didn't see that happen. Right. A good floor will use the dealer as one of his, you know, one of his best sources of information about what happened. Having played under the guise of the dealers at the World Series of Poker, would you trust them to be the adjudicators? Andy Block. <laughs> well, no, of course not. I mean, there's some great dealers. I think most of the dealers are great, but there were some that were just, uh, you know, I'm like 100% sure they were on drugs while they were dealing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a headline right there. <laughs> so, Andy Block. You know, no, I didn't trust it. <laughs> All right, yeah. In Paul Freeman's place. <laughs> in Paul Freeman's place, Phil Galpon, what do you do? Um, it's tough to say. I mean, I definitely wouldn't award award the pot to him. The thing is, he, I can't tell if he must, um, thinking that the the uh, you know the floor said his hand was dead, or if he must because he saw a better hand, which is what you do when you call and see a better hand. Um, I think, I mean, if anything, maybe he could hold on to his hand a little bit longer until it's worked out, you know, exactly what's happened. Um, but in the moment, you know, he could have just thrown his hand away because that's a reaction when you see a better hand. I, I can't really blame him for what he did. Jessica Wellman, do you walk away from your World Series over dreams for fair play? I don't think that you would be allowed to give someone 100,000 chips if the floor has ruled that they didn't earn them by winning the hand. That. I, I don't know. I would like to think in this situation I would hold on to my hand a little longer, but it's it's like sports. If a call goes your way, you may know that it probably didn't. It probably wasn't fair for it to go that way, but sometimes it happens, and you make the you make the better situation. Aaron Bean, how are you? Well, I think you know there's a larger there's a larger competition going on. You know, the the poker tournament isn't just Prahlad heads up against Ted Bort. You know, he's playing against thousands of other people. And, you know, if he's in that spot and and he said something before, like, oh, I really think my hand should be dead, whatever, and the floor ends up killing his hand, well, that's not really – that's putting him at a disadvantage against other professional poker players in the tournament. Like maybe Phil Ivey at table over is in the same spot, and he doesn't say anything, and, and, you know, the call stays and his hand stays live. So I think it's – you know, it's – giving yourself a competitive disadvantage there. And I don't feel you're obligated to, to say anything at all when the floor makes a ruling like that, where it's you know, clearly a very close call. For the record, if I were Tony Reality, extra point to Aaron Bean for knowing Ted Bork's name. Andy Block, knowing that the entire world, embodied by 20 people watching this vidcast, are going to be watching you next time you're in the tournament floor, what do you do? What do I do as a tournament director, as a player, or what? No, as Paula, if you're in Paula Freeman situation, what do you do? Well, I mean, I mean, uh, I think, I mean, I don't think anybody would really do much different. I mean, you can say, no, I called, I called, I called. But if you had a good hand, then you know, if you, if it was in the opposite situation, what would happen? That that's a real big thing. In the opposite situation, and I'm not even sure he can voluntarily say, I called, give my chips to the other player. Because that that would be chip something too. It's like you know, let's say somebody accidentally raises you, and you know it's a clear accident, but the rules, because they threw in too many chips, make it clear that they have to raise you. You got the nuts. Do you re-raise them? Hundred percent, you have to re-raise them because otherwise, to do anything else would be soft play. So, you know, yes, you've kind of taken advantage of a bad ruling, 
perhaps, but I don't think I don't think there's a, tri- a a choice here. I mean, I'm not even sure if a lot has a choice and can say, "Here, take my chips." Now, there's another thing here that you didn't point out is that the other player should not have turned over his hand so quickly. If he kept his hand face down, the forward 100 per- until he was 100 percent sure that Perlot said call and that it was ruled a call. You know, if if his hand was still face down, what would the floor had said? It might have been a different answer there, and it very likely would have been a different answer there if they hadn't seen the hand. And, you know, a lot of times you misunderstand something. It happens a lot, actually, many more times in that World Series. I'm sure that somebody turned their hand up, face up, when the opponent uh, didn't say call, but they thought they had said call. So, you know, don't he should not have turned his hand face up, too. I'm not saying it's 100% his fault, but that contributed a lot to this particular instance. Don't turn your hand face up until it's clear that it's called. Pause even an extra couple of seconds. Did he make it? Is it a call in this situation? You know, there's a lot of times, you know, people have such bad accents sometimes, and it's so noisy. I They say full, but I think they said call. <laughs> Andy Block showing why he's one of my favorite interviews in the entire poker industry. Folks, we're getting a little bit low on time, so I'm going to speed through our final topic. World Championship of Online Poker. WCOO is biggest online tournament series with 62 events leading up to a championship with just announced $2 million guarantee. After its 11 events thus far in the 2010 edition, the total prize money handed out is over $12 million, and total entries are over 32000 In the history of the event, they've given out $170 million bucks. Outside of the online poker circle, is this tournament series given enough recognition by the poker world? Let's start with Aaron B. Well, well, I mean, it's not televised, so you, you have to take that into account. You know, if I told my friends I'm playing the World Championship of Online Poker, the ones that haven't played online poker, even the ones that are interested in other forms of poker, won't know what I'm talking about. And that's probably not likely to change unless they find a way to televise it somehow. Right now, TV is, is how the poker community at large is connected. How would you okay. consider uh, televising it, Aaron? Like this? Like this? We have nine little watch where we watch <laughs> people as they play. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that, guys. You know, I'm not really sure. One one way would be to, to you know, not televise it live the same way, you know, have highlights. Like replays and, on stars, yeah. Well, and show show important hands. And, and, you know, you'd have to do a lot of, a lot of non-poker coverage of, you know, you could cover the people, record them in their homes playing, talk about, you know, what they like, what their quirks are, you know. It's luck. Is this a major at this point? How big a deal is the WCO P Championship compared to, say, the Legends of the Poker? Well, since I don't play the WCO P, <laughs> I don't think it's a big deal at all. But, you know, the f pops now, you know, that's super important. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, there there will come a time, I think, when uh, after we, I think it will come after we get the licensing and regulation of online poker down, where we're going to be able to maybe even have like the final table of these major tournaments televised. Perhaps even if maybe just people come, uh, the nine final table players come together and all play on a computer, either in the same room or on TV or whatever, and that would also, you know, eliminate some of the, you know, people wouldn't worry about people sharing accounts and things like that because you'd have to see that person on that account. Um, so I, I think it, it'll it'll get there. It'll become bigger once we clear that hurdle, I think, and um, can integrate a little bit more with the online tournaments and the live tournaments. First part of that question, that answer was definitely done, Andy. Very nicely done. Uh, <laughs> Phil Galpon, World Series of Poker, has scheduled their WSOP year against the World Series of Online Poker. They underestimate the importance of this event. I mean, I don't think that uh, a lot of the people playing in the in the World Series of Poker Europe would forego playing um, to, to play online. I think it'd be nice if, if they were scheduled so that they didn't overlap. But I think um, I don't think they need to, you know, schedule themselves around every online tournament and everything else going on. They should, you know, schedule it when it works for them and when they want. Jessica Wellman, agree? 
I think so. I'm, I'm sure there are some players I was talking to, uh, Mickey Peterson, Matt Mori online, who is playing World Series of Poker Europe and was a little frustrated that he couldn't play both. But I think that trying to schedule around online tournaments when you're dealing with one of the bigger European tournaments of the year is just not something that we're going to see happening in the next few years. The obvious issue to me with regards to the online coverage is the lack of human names and faces to go with with those names. For the sake of the of the event and their credibility and, and the attention they might get, should players be contractually obligated to certain media commitments that come with winning? Aaron Bean. I think uh, that might be a, you know, obviously sites can, can ask you for whatever they want when they register, you agree. You know, like, for example, you now agree that you can have your whole cards shown when that was, that's a relatively new thing. I think in terms of keeping everyone happy, if they were to ever try something like that, they'd have to add some money to the prize pool or, or add some money based on, on your media appearances that you actually end up doing, you know, some sort of logo deal or, you know, I think without a financial incentive, players aren't going to like it, but I think it's absolutely within their rights to do that. And with that, folks, it may seem to those watching this podcast as if we've been doing this for about an hour, but in actuality, it's been three days that we've been recording. Thank you very much to our guests for, for sitting through the technical glitches. Before we leave, I want to give each of you an opportunity to hawk your wares, as it were. Aaron Bean, tell us what people can do to see you and find out more about you on the Internet. Well, I just started a blog. It's at aaronbean.rpmpoker.com. And uh, I'll be blogging partly about my involvement in RPM Poker, which is a, a new growing poker site, and partly about my life in general and, and about other things. I'm planning a big post about the World Championship of Online Poker, for example. Andy Block, do you have any online site affiliations you'd like to talk about? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, uh, obviously I'll be playing. You can catch me playing on Full Tilt Poker, and in a couple of days I'm, I'm headed to London to uh, – Take over Europe, the World Series of Poker Europe, and win my first bracelet there. And, you know, you can always reach me on Twitter, Andy underscore Block, B-L-O-C-H. And, uh, you know, I take emails and other requests. Phil Galifon, are you by chance involved with this poker static thing you're hearing about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess they're already here. I don't need to, uh, to shout out too much. Uh, you guys are here at Poker Static, uh, so keep coming back and watching videos, and I... I do also make training videos over at bluefirepoker.com. All right. Jessica Wellman, Bluff Magazine, WPT, what else? Um, I am the news person for This Week in Poker. If you like video podcasts and want a little more, a uh, little less strategy, a little more news talk, kind of like this one, definitely check it out. Poker Beat with you on Poker Road. And speaking of WCOOP, you can get WCOOP coverage on bluffmagazine.com. Every day we've got results, reports, who's doing well, who's on the leaderboard. So check it out. Uh, I believe you misspoke. I think it's the award-winning Poker Beat. My bad. There you go. As for me, folks, you can check out my articles at ESPN.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at GaryWise1. Um, other than that, you can find me on Poker Static. I'm going to be doing this for a little while, hopefully. Thank you very much, panel. We really do appreciate your coming and sharing your thoughts. This has been Gary Wise versus the world. Go hit some rivers, folks.